Stay hungry, stay foolish. As always, thank you to our friends over at Zai, a global financial services company specializing in foreign exchange and payments and supporting innovation of all kinds, including this show. Check them out at hellozai.com. When post war American business was a vast sea of gray flannel suits and tasteful ties, a few unorthodox individuals were not so quietly shifting the paradigm towards the breezier, googlier workplace of today. These change agents include a raft of idealistic social scientists, as well as non academics like labor organizer Saul Alinsky, who pioneered the use of shareholder activism to open codex doors to more African Americans. Alinsky, who was literally willing to smash dishes to get attention, was the embodiment of the activist principle that behaving badly is sometimes necessary because in the words of the civil rights anthem, the nice ways always fail. The person who was willing to make a great sacrifice to change an institution he or she loves is a hero as well as a heretic because our guest writes, the future of industrial society depends on our ability to transcend the destructive management of the past and build a better kind of business. We welcome the author of The Age of Heretics, a history of the radical thinkers who reinvented corporate management and its earlier subtitle was Heroes, Outlaws and the Forerunners of Corporate Change. It is a phenomenal book, one of many written by today's guest, Art Liner. Welcome to the show. Thank you. What a great introduction. Thrilled to be here. Thank you. It's, it's so great to have you on the show. Me and Art, it's, it's, we're recording this during Christmas, by the way, it's Christmas week. We're coming into Christmas Eve. And we've been tic tacking forward and back, wondering how are we going to get through so much of the content that's in the, this book. And there's it's so apt of our time. Art, you've done so much research on this book. And I thought the way we might start is to introduce the work you're doing today, what you've seen in the past 20 years since you've written the book, what's changed, what hasn't changed. Unfortunately, it's more the latter, but also what type of work you're doing today in the whole aspect of corporate change. Right now, I'm doing a lot of work with helping people put their ideas into into play as thought leaders, as you know, I'm a content strategist. Uh, I have a firm with Juliet Powell called Kleiner Powell International, or KPI. And we work with a lot of prominent companies and, and writers, you know, business authors who need help figuring out what they have to say. But we're also really looking, the, the Age of Heretics was written for people who, and it's written for people who are kind of in an organization. And, you know, when you're in an organization, you're suffused with fear. I was at uh, PwC for 15 years. I Well, PwC and before that, Booz and & Company, and before that, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. I was the editor-in-chief of strategy and business. And I didn't realize until I left just how much expedience, you know, every day-to-day -day decision that we have to make just for the sake of making a decision has kind of fear at its core. I'm going to screw up. You know, people are not going to give me what I need. I'm going, you know, and at the same time, organizations depend on innovation. They depend on people who break the rules a little bit or at the very least bend them. So a lot of the people that I wrote about in the Age of Heretics, a lot of the people that I work with are people who genuinely have something that they want to do. They have a truth that they see that contradicts the organization a little bit. And they also have families. They have kids in college to support, or they have, you know, reasons why they're they're they need to earn a living, as most of us do. And so they balance all of that. They balance safety with breaking the rules. And they this is not a new phenomenon, but starting with the Industrial Revolution, it became more and more of a phenomenon because the people who found themselves in this position, there were just a lot more of them. And they particularly began to emerge in the 60s and 70s. And now, you know, most of the people you meet in business in one way or another 
are innovators. They have to be. And at the same time, they know that they're rising in the ranks. Getting their bonus depends on giving people what they want. It's so difficult, though, Art, isn't it? I mean, you, you've you mentioned those organizations you worked in. And one of the things that that this show has taught me and also working in in organizational change is is to have empathy, because it's very hard. You, you know, you want to judge the person as a laggard and for stopping you and come on, wake up, the world's changing, we got to snap out of it here. But at the same time, to your point, they have a mortgage and they have bills and maybe university college to pay off all these kind of things. And we've no idea what's going through their heads. A lot of what we think of as maturity in, in the workplace, especially, you know, we go to work and we have to do things that we think of as mature. We can't act out. We can't, you know, we can't give in to our impulses. And so we learn to curb them, but we really start to rise when we learn to apply our what psychologists call an executive function and the word executive means the same thing in business that it means in neuroscience it means marshalling the resources that you have in the way that's best for the long term mm -hmm. and so we learn to do that but we never really know that that's that's our currency for moving ahead. That, that's our currency as thinkers or leaders inside the company. And as a result, we kind of have to become more conscious of it. And a lot of what I wrote about in the Age of Heretics is people, you know, it's like fish swimming in the aquarium and then suddenly noticing this is water. <laughs> and it isn't. I, you know, I have to have empathy, as you said, I have to, you know, I'm working with people, and people are affected by what I do, just as much as if we were in a family together. In fact, we're probably together more, at least before COVID, than we will than I am with my, you know, with the family in my home. And what I do matters, and how we're set up matters. And once you see that you can't, you really can't unsee it in a company. And then you realize you have to, you have to act differently. You have to act differently than you have to treat people differently than maybe your boss treated you. And that word family is so important. Like when you're making these decisions, like when you're a heretic, like m most of our listeners are heretics, or they have this inkling deep inside where they need to change either in their role or, or in their career. You know, the timing of this show and go, just going out is quite apt apart from the great resignation it's you know new year's resolution time and people often after christmas time have that kind of realization i hate my job my my boss is a jackass whatever but but i think the other thing is the the pressure apart from the mortgage and all those responsibilities it's the family so if you're married or you have people depending on you it's not you just being the heretic to do what's best for you and it's very difficult. People get stuck. They're kind of going, I can't do this. I'm not like some 20 year old something living on a couch that I can just make flippant decisions like, you know, go down and go on an ayahuasca <laughs> journey down in the South America. I got to be responsible here. And that's a huge blocker, right? It is. Or at least it's a challenge to find the joy in responsibility for a lot of us. You know, and a lot of the most well-known business people are kind of people who, in one way or another, resist growing up. You know, the classic example being Steve Jobs. But, and yet they have matured in, in a whole other way. They, they can see things that other people don't see. And I think a lot of what, so there's a lot of management ideas around now and arguably there's never been as many business books as there are now coming out every month and most of them are trying to help people figure out how do i develop this kind of growth in myself and my company people have figured out that personal growth and business growth are connected they're linked and therefore in order to grow as a leader, as a manager, I have to grow personally. 
at the same time, how much should a company, how much personal growth should a business expect from people? How much of that kind of moral or individual um, focus, how much of, you know, focusing of our attention in a way that used to be the domain of religion and spirituality and now is part and parcel of being a better leader. How much should a company or, or a government agency expect from its people? You know, what's reasonable to, to expect? I don't think we've got an answer to that question. And a lot of what intrigued me about the age of heretics, when, you know, which is really a history of ideas and practice and of people, was the way that people have been wrestling with that, you know, at least since World War II. What do we, what's expected of us to really succeed? Yeah, I love it. I, I love it, Art. I, I, I'm so eager to jump in. So I before before we do, I think it's really important to explain how you write it, because I was thinking about you, you know, out with the, the flip charts, the architecture of, of the book, really, and you know, the whole idea of the analogy using the different religious orders, for example, the Pelagians, and then actually, you know, bringing in what was the heresy they cr committed, and then unfold the story. And I loved it. So I love that type of writing. But the, the amount of research behind it is phenomenal. And it was so useful for me. I, I work in corporate executive training, but also as an exec coach. And to see the history of those people that actually made, created this craft was just so useful. It was, it was a joy to read. And uh, we're only today, by the way, to our audience, we're only going to get through half of it. Uh, Art and I are going to come back and do a part two as well. And he he d gave you a little teaser there to the neuroscience of the work that he's doing today as well, which is we'll get into on part two. But Art, how about you just give a little overview of how you wrote it, and then we'll actually follow a formula of how to actually get through the content. Glad to. So I was fresh out of journalism school, pretty much, and I went to work for a publication called the Whole Earth Catalog. And I don't know if you remember it, but it was, you know, it was Stuart Brand uh, published it. Steve Jobs mentioned it in his last commencement address. It was sort of, it was a huge mm -hmm. book coming out of the counterculture about um, what was, what was worthwhile. And they, you know, so how to build a house, how to think about systems, um, how to do, uh, how to do, how to use early computers. We're talking about the sixties and seventies when it appeared. And in the eighties, it was Stuart Brand revised it, and I went to work for it, and, and we came out with the next Tall Earth Catalog. And as part of that, we were there with the early days of Silicon Valley. So they would invite us to talk to some of these companies. And I got the impression that there were some people in the companies who really knew what they were doing. But there was a lot of people who were just kind of figuring it out as they went along, not always very well. And I left to go back to New York and write. And I got a job. I, I was asked to meet with a obscure, then obscure academic at MIT who had a 1200 page manuscript and needed, you know, some uh, editing support to bring it down to about 400 pages. And that was the fifth discipline by Peter Senge. And I worked with Peter, you know, on and off for quite a while ever since. I was still working together a bit. And that book introduced a number of concepts, a shared vision, and, you know, talked about scenario planning. And I had been reading histor historians like William Manchester, The Glory and the Dream, and Barbara Tuckman. And I was really interested in where these ideas came from and how they had developed. So I started looking into it. And there were, you know, very powerful, influential people. Um, Margaret Mead, uh, you know, Douglas McGregor at MIT, and uh, some who were not as Saul Alinsky, as you mentioned, and, and Ralph Nader was in there. And, and they all had tried to influence corporations from the inside. And there were people they worked with who were in corporations who saw something that the company didn't officially acknowledge, but the company needed it. 
you know, the quality movement at General Motors and Ford, where, you know, giving people more autonomy and authority on the shop floor made for better cars. And the idea that uh, small teams could run a production process much better than top-down authority. And the Pelagian idea, which, you know, that, you know, you get better results when you treat people as if they are worthwhile and working and have some intrinsic interest in the work they're doing instead of just being hired for money. These ideas that, you know, we, we learn them as we work with people and we internalize them, but we sort of think they're a little bit, you know, they're not quite right. They're not, they're a little heretical. These ideas had been building since World War II, really, in people in the eyes of people in organizations. And so I started to piece that history together. It turned out that there was a lot of, even though they were disparate threads, there was a lot of interconnection and there were mystic uh, influencers like uh, G.I. Gurdjieff in the mix and, and psychedelic drugs made a little appearance there and other things. And so I was able to kind of piece the story together. And in along the way, I learned how basically uh, enlightened management works and that became most of what i did for the rest of my career that's beautiful man I, i'm gonna uh i'm gonna i'm gonna tee up now and bring our audience on that journey so it's it's such an enjoyable read i really highly recommend it it's still available there i beautiful hardback copy behind me here as well that i that i got online and later in the book art you say in place of consensus or democracy there was a kind of jazz-like creativity. And you were talking here about those teams working together. And so what I'm going to propose is that we use that as a freestyle kind of way, freestyle jazz approach to, to our conversation today. I'll play a little solo and intro piece that will remind you then of the book. And then you can bring us on a journey and we'll sort of sit back and listen. So you start the book with monastics and under each title, then there's a subtitle. And this one is corporate culture and its discontents 1945 to today. And the heresy they committed was business is always personal. And here you say the historian John P. Davis tells us that the great great grandfathers of today's large mainstream corporations was that were the monasterians of the early Christian church. Uh, that's my tee up over to you to bring the freestyle jazz to life. We're talking about the dark ages and we're talking and now we know that the dark ages were not as terrible as they're made out to be but they were pretty terrible you know a lot of might for might makes right a lot of knowledge of how to do things scientifically was lost and a lot of stagnation and very very few people were literate and so a lot of the literacy was in monasteries where the old manuscripts were preserved always local there's no printing press there's no there's no definitely no internet there's a lot you know people communicated history through songs so they had to memorize and that became the way in which you know tradition was passed down and then gradually these songs were written down and that becomes like the 9th 10th 11th 12th century literature that we look at and there were you know the plagues so during all this time, there are gatherings of people preserving the um, preserving guidance. It was very natural for those Christian monasteries, and we're talking just about Europe um, at this point. The rest of the world had other traditions and other, other ways of um, managing its knowledge. But it was very natural for Christian monasteries to gradually become universities the ecclesiastical universities where they didn't just meet and talk, but they started teaching and they started broadening the knowledge and starting with, you know, the printing press and, and reformation and all of the ferment in Europe, you had more and more people who were able to study and learn. And then gradually by the time we reach the 19th century, there is a body of people, they disagree, you know, there's, but there is a body of people who recognize that knowledge is not just about what's handed down, but it's about how we learn to do. 
how we learn to do things. And some of that knowledge is less and less in the guilds, which is another great ancestor to the, to the corporations. By about the 15th century, when the joint stock companies were, began to be created, they were tied to sailing vessels. You know, a, a monarch could not send an explorer out to discover new land or trade for spices or do both without helping to shoulder some of the burden of risk. So some of the legal documents that today involve, you know, shareholder rights in Delaware have their history, have their, um, their roots in the agreements made between monarchs and sea captains saying, go forth, take some risks, you know, invent, put all your money into this boat, come back. If you're not rich, at least you won't be thrown in debtor's prison. I will protect you and you'll be able to try again. And which is, you know, the core of a corporation, the whole despa- de- debate over whether companies are people or not starts with this question of risk. What support do we give somebody who takes a risk on behalf of their own business and yet fails? And, you know, one of the first economist, Adam Smith, one of the things he recognized is that taking a risk for yourself in business, while it can be enormously exploitive, is also a public service. Without it, we wouldn't have economic growth. So, you know, the monasteries, all that stuff leads up to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, everything explodes, right? We're talking 19th century. Um, So, you know, the railroad, the telegraph, and then telephone, the automobile. Suddenly, nobody is forced to stay in the town with the family that they grew up. Many people do. But there is now the economic support for people to leave, to recreate their lives, to have a level of choice that formerly was available to only a very, very few people. Now, a lot of people starting in England and Germany and France and then in the United States and then in all of the Western countries, suddenly there is that level of choice sort of seen as part of the human condition. And corporations are a big part of that. There's a key term as well. And this this has a resurgence, hopefully today, but it, but it certainly was something that was a desire in the 60s and onwards when you talk about that part of the history. But it's the term vernacular. And I think this this was important. I hadn't known this. And, and this was a real aha moment for me as well. So I think I'd love you to describe the importance of that. I got that term from Ivan Ilyich, a philosopher who I met and, and worked with a little bit, a really wonderful man who was a mentor to many, many people. And his view is that many of the attitudes of the West, when they dealt with, um, when they dealt with emerging cultures, emerging countries, emerging economies, were overbearing and overly mechanistic and really had the effect of bringing the, bringing the, 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 they really had an effect of bringing the, the, the Western or the, the industrialized country to dominate the not just the other countries, but the vernacular spirit, the folk spirit that had created many of the environments, ways of life, architecture, medicine um, that 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 make people feel comfortable and good. That we had sat, you know, we humanity sacrificed something with the scientific method, and what that something was was um, we'd sacrificed a lot of our folk wisdom. And corporations, corporate practice was a big part of it. So in the book, I struggled to figure out a word for the opposite of vernacular. And I ended up with the numbers culture. In other words, where you do things by the numbers. And Frederick Taylor, I didn't make a big deal of this in the book, but Taylor was really the epitome of, you know, the one best way there is a rational view of how best to do things. And that should be imposed. And that way of life suffused 
the overlay of what a company was supposed to be. And you were supposed to ignore the personal, right? right? Just, just business, nothing personal. You were supposed to pretend that anybody could fit into a slot in a company and do the same thing. And that the company's practices and processes and machines, like a machine, were interchangeable parts. And around the 50s, that began to be seen as really damaging to the human spirit and to the bottom line. And so we had a period of about 25, 30 years where people pretended to be doing things by the numbers, but were actually under the surface doing, you know, the best of them, the most successful, were doing things in other ways. I have a quote here that I absolutely love. I'm I'm going to keep doing this to you, man, and, and I'll I'll bring us down many rabbit holes, by the way, as well. And uh, here's one of them. I I love this, and I I contemplated actually using this as the introductory introductory paragraph for for today's show. But you said corporate culture was a vast wave, com- comforting the, to those whose natures fit with it splashing across all competing desires for power and fulfillment, carrying progress and industry to every other culture. It struck with such immense captivating grandeur that there seemed to be no escape. But the greater the wave, the stronger the undertow. This book is a story about that undertow. It started small, it built up greater and greater influence until now the heretical ideas of the corporate past are the business mainstream of the present and especially the near future, which I guess is today. We live in an age of heretics, an age where unconventional ideas become conventional wisdom rapidly. And that's a good thing, because the future of industrial society depends on our ability to transcend the destructive management of the past and build a better kind of business. I absolutely love that. And I thought that'd be a nice way to introduce the idea of the, if you want to call it the corporate heretic, and your definition, I mentioned it briefly in the introduction, but I'd love to hear from the man himself. When I started looking into all of these types of management, and by the way, I hope I'm not too long winded. Please, no, no, I like that's, you know, what? And, and let's say this now, because I said to you this before the show, is that um, many of the books I, I read and many modern day books are just skim the surface. And I, I think it's a it's for the work we do. And for for like one of my own personal goals is to is to become a better thinker consistently, whether that's with biases or heuristics or, or um, schema that I have you know, set like jello over the last 40 odd years, that I can revisit them and reset them. And one of the ways to do that is to read deeply. And I, 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 I much rather go in deep like that. And, and I just wanted to recognize that as well. So please go deep as, as you like. And maybe you have a comment on that art as well, because you've seen that change in business text. There's a lot of it's never been as easy to publish a business book. And it's never been as hard to find the real information you're looking for because, and that was, but I used to think that was an artifact of our time. And when I did the age of heretics, I was trying to find the management ideas that really had influenced and and others and pull them together. And especially the ones that were outside the mainstream that had come from outside and now were in the mainstream. And so I'm really, I'm, I mean, I'm just grateful for what you've said. At the same time, I got into it because I wanted to tell stories about people, you know, and, and in that sense, I'm, I'm more like a kind of popular historian than I am like an academic historian, maybe, or ideally both. And when I did The Age of Heretics, I was looking for the people who were like the people I saw, you know, they, and, and, and. I tried, I interviewed probably a thousand people and I looked always for the people whose stories would just click first with me and and then with a reader. And so the, and the other thing I'll say, this sounds, I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but 
if I ever have any line that gets into something like Bartlett's quotations, I hope it's the one you read. It's, you know, the bigger the wave, the stronger the undertow. I really believe that. I believe right. that happening every, every time in politics, nothing, nothing comes in without it goes out. And every time in business, they may, you know, the waves may get stronger, but there's always an undertow. And so when I went to look at the numbers culture, when I learned to look at the, and I came out of the counterculture, I came out of the whole earth catalog. Um, I worked on the Haight Ashbury switchboard uh, for a while. And when I went into business, at first I felt about business the way a lot of my friends in the counterculture still do, like business. You know, this is like an evil environment. And capitalism is inherently corrupt. I came to the conclusion that as somebody who, you know, at the time I was married, I had to support a family. And I came to the conclusion that anybody who has to work for a living cannot think capitalism is corrupt. They can think corruption is corrupt. And there is immense temptation and immense reality of corruption in the capitalist system. But it's a little bit like, you know, driving down the highway, you see an accident and you think this road is vicious. You know, this road is terrible. People are dying all the time on this road. But you don't notice all the people who are following in lane and leaving enough space behind and the system is working really well. You know, and, and I feel about capitalism that way. We really need to keep an eye on its abuses. And that's been true since since the robber barons in the United States and the vicious, you know, poor houses in the UK before that, and all the colonial abuses of the joint stock companies. But that's not the whole story. It's not even the main story. It's the really important sub story. And there are some great fortunes that don't have great crimes behind them. There's a lot to do. No, but it, it's great, man. And, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump around now because I know we were we're on the monas monastics, but I'm gonna jump forward to the Ford era because you you do mention this. So, you know, when you when you mention these things like, um, uh, for example, you know, I I think of a modern day example: Tesla, Elon Musk, uh, you know, open source open source the 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 system. So, well then everybody, all, all boats rise together. So everybody then starts mass adopting um, electric vehicles or battery car powered vehicles. And then Tesla has a bit bigger slice of a bigger pie. So I, I thought about that. But because you talked about Ford and Ford increasing the the the, the minimum wage to five dollars, uh, giving people more time investing in people more and more, and um, starting to hire more and more multiracial people as well, which was a big change at the time. But the whole idea was to create a middle class as well. So you do tip the hat to that and kind of go, there was a benefit, but it was a social, it was a social movement. And I'm going to jump to there because th that ties into what you just said here. You know, he got sued by his shareholders. And the reason he lost the, sh the lawsuit, so the, the, the shareholders who, by the way, with the Dodge brothers, if you've ever had a Dodge, that they got bought by General Motors. They didn't. They didn't last. But they sued. They were big shareholders and suppliers to Ford, and he had. He was paying five dollars a day to his workers, an enormous investment, and they sued him because he wasn't paying that money to shareholders first. And Ford, on the witness stand, said something like. You know, if you, the judge said, you know, or the prosecutor said, so you mean you pay people money that you don't have to pay to their shareholders? And Ford said, yeah, if you do that, the money just comes to you. You can't help it. If you do good business, you'll get, you know, and you treat people well, you'll prosper. It turns out that isn't always the case. And, but if you know what you're doing in terms of what you're doing with the business and how you treat people, Ford was right. And yet 
And so we have exploitative, extractive interests, and they'll always be there. And you can't get them, you can't curb them entirely by rules, because there's always a way for exploiters to get around the rules, as we've seen. And you can't curb them by shame, because shame is a blunt instrument also, just like the law. And the only way you can curb them oddly enough, Adam Smith came up with this, is to cultivate, well, it's through the recognition that those who win in the end are the kinds of leaders who can be strategic and who can carry within themselves a voice that looks at themselves like, like you would look at someone else. You know, Adam Smith said, he called it the impartial spectator. My colleagues, uh, Jeffrey Schwartz and Josie Thompson and I call it the wise advocate. It's uh, Smith talked about being praiseworthy. It's not just that you get praised, but that you're worthy of it, that you and you recognize in, in yourself. And in a way, when I started interviewing people in business and when I work in business, easily 90% of the people I meet are driven by the desire to be praiseworthy in their personal lives and in their professional lives, they don't just want to get reward and recognition. They want that, but they want to deserve it. And as I think about it, that's the thing that all business people have in common. They know the value of recognition and, just, and deserving recognition. I love that. And, and it ties nicely to Ford, actually, because uh, particularly Henry Ford, the second, Hank the Juice, because he, he had inherited this fortune, but he, he wanted then, then to actually use it for good for social good and, and have his own stamp on the world. And, and you see this a lot with wealthy individuals, particularly that, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're born into such privilege. You want to make it. You want to make your own name. You want to do it yourself. And um, I might jump to there, but I'll I'll tee you up again. Uh, my little jazz solo here to tee you up, because I'm skipping ahead here, and we'll, we might come back to Kodak as well, because the Kodak story was fantastic. And again, when you wrote this, Kodak had not gone bankrupt because it was 08 when when you mentioned Kodak last in the book. The reason I'm saying this, by the way, is it's important to see why there was a shift towards the importance of shareholder value or shareholder return on investment. Because this, as we know, in business cripples so many organizations where they don't make long term decisions, they are slaves to the next quarter, and sometimes the next monthly board meeting in so many organizations because of shareholders calling for the return on investment, you say here, since the early 1950s, the predominant ownership of corporate stock had shifted from investment banks to new types of shareholding institutions. A typical company had 40% of its stock owned by pension funds, and pension funds through bonds typically controlled 40% of most companies' debts. After a stock slowdown in 1966, the pension fund managers began to compare notes on the performance of their investments more carefully. And here's a quote from an AT&T pension fund manager named John English. He said, I don't think anyone really knew how well or how poorly funds were doing until 1967. But now that they did know, they began to impose more and more pressure on managers of companies whose shares they held. Hence, increasing, pro increasing pressure like the Dodge brothers on where's my return on investment? Don't you go wasting my money on training people and all these airy fairy, uh, you know, Eastern traditions, don't you do that? That's my money. Hence, I'll sue you if I'm Dodge versus Ford. But that's a nice little tee up for you to bring it whichever way you like art and go as long as you like, man. It's freestyle jazz. So this is a stop. <laughs> Silence moment. Um, Whoa. So, you know, what's under that story is lack of trust between investors and managers. And when you finally compare notes, you see that there is a long period of coasting in most companies. This is right at the beginning of the era where companies could no longer just coast along in the way that they had. You know, Alvin Toffler called it future shock. Um, 
Pierre Vock, one of the other characters in my book, calls it the rapids. But, you know, starting around the 70s, it's not as easy. The United States is no longer the only country with big companies. There's starting to be Japanese car companies that are competing with the Americans. You know, there's starting to be uh, British consumer products companies like Unilever. They're smaller, they try harder, they're more aggressive, and they're doing things that the, um, you know, the dominant companies aren't. And in areas like energy, they're starting to be a little trickling in um, alternative types of fuels. So there's pressure that there wasn't before, and the shareholders notice it. And they notice that the really steady growth in returns is starting to level off. And that some companies really aren't doing that well. And by the time they get to the 80s, they're pretty disenchanted with a lot of, you know, with a lot of companies. So you get films like uh, Other People's Money and uh, Wall Street, you know, sort of articulating this impatience with financial return. And what's really underneath it is the population is aging. Baby boomers, you know, this big you know, um, pig in the python of, of demographics are now need to know that they have returns coming for retirement. The fund managers are getting more competitive and money is seeking more return and they're not finding it where they found it before in the stocks and bonds of yesteryear. And that's a long trend that continues to the present day. There is now, uh, Ari DeHuis wrote a book uh, called The Living Company. He was a shell group planning manager, a group planning executive. He wrote a book called The Living Company in which he said, you know, money is no longer scarce. Capital is no longer the scarce thing you need in order to own a company. The scarce thing is people. And he saw that in 1990. A lot of investors didn't see it, but they acted on it. And so they, you know, there was this hunger to have better and better returns that put pressure on companies underneath it is the question who gets trusted one of the big innovators in management in the 90s is jack welch and he's trusted you know 80s and 90s but um he's trusted because he's ruthless he's ruthless on but but he's not ruthless on behalf of the shareholders necessarily, yes, but he's ruthless like Henry Ford was ruthless. He's ruthless like I'm going to go to the wall for what I know works and for my people. And he created a high perform what we now call a high performance company. is brutal. It's a brutal place to work. I had people, you know, complete but then I interviewed sort of saying yeah it was a great it was creative it was high powered it was wonderful really nice to work there until you remembered all the nights out of town and the affairs and the drunken you know and the alcoholism and the careers that ended at 35 when you got kicked out and so there was something unsustainable about GE or sustainable only as long as people were expendable. And that's how a lot of hard driving companies were. Um, Aiden, I'm gonna do a jump myself. R right at the beginning um, of the book, there's an anecdote about what about Michael Maccabee, who's um, a management writer, and he, was, he wrote a book called The Gamesman in, I think it's the 80s. And it's, it might have been the 70s. But he interviewed a number of people from like Hewlett Packard and other high tech companies in particular. High powered, hard rolling, you know, hard driving, steam, you know, real high performance companies. And <clears throat> he said there was this personality type where they were like, they didn't really, you know, they, they cared about people, they wanted a good team, they, but mostly they were just playing a game and they wanted to win. And 
they, it was great. It was jovial. You know, you go there and it's kind of like Silicon Valley today in a lot of respects. You come in and everybody is, you know, sort of in, in the same spirit. We're going to crush everybody. And we're going to crush each other, by the way, in between crushing everybody else. And so there's an anecdote. I know you, you wanted to talk about this one. Um, Maccabee asked them who their heroes were. He asked the people he interviewed. And it was all a short list. Abraham Lincoln, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, John Kennedy, and Robert Kennedy. And I, he told me the story in an interview, and he's like looking there. And Maccabee is, you know, an academic-looking guy. He did a lot of work in, in. Um, he had a background where he talked to a lot of people in factories and talked to a lot of executives and very straight talking, straightforward guy. And he's like puts his hand in his head and he goes, head in his hands, and he goes, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what they were. What it was, and then I looked at it, and they had all been assassinated, all these heroes. And I said, why? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> it, maybe they felt that, you know, maybe they identified with that kind of sacrifice. Maybe they felt that you had to, you know, you were taking your life in your hands when you got to a high position in a company. Or maybe it was just a representation of the pressure they were under, but they, but but the data was was there, and I think a lot of it had to do with this, you know, the numbers culture, the old we we just follow the rules and we make it work, had now evolved into this. We're now in a high pressure situation. Shareholders are breathing down our neck. They don't trust us. We don't trust the people around us. We have to squeeze in order to keep from being squeezed ourselves and people couldn't live that way it, it ties so beautifully art to we're, I, we might jump now back to i will come back to ford because ford's really interesting when when we look at social change the reformists of, of social change but i it, you made me think there of the work done in png and then the work done in in general foods as well because the the team come in they want to ref, they want to change the way they work you know crappy manufacturing work you know they're basically working in in sheds really poor conditions teams come in want to change things bringing in all these uh you know and i'm i'm doing air quotes here for people who can't hear us airy fairy kind of crazy uh what was the term you used um um kind of uh religious almost type people and and as a result then when there was a changing of the guard at management the first thing they come in and go who the heck is this guy or girl and like what you're experimenting with company money building a new factory of the future that's not the way things are done kid you're out of here and then the the ejector buttons pressed and they're bumped out of the company because you see that today still art like that happens when you know, as long as somebody's protected by, and I don't mean protected as in they're not doing a good job and somebody's masking it. I mean, they're protected to experiment. And then there's a changing of the guard. Somebody's brought in, maybe they're t brought in and gone, you know, Kleiner, go in there and clean that place up. And you go in straight away with that kind of mathematical mindset. I'm going to scientific, scientific mindset, shareholder return. And you go, well, this thing's got to go down, shut down the innovation lab, shut down the change. It happens today. It's happened during the pandemic. We've seen loads of labs closed down. And it's because, you know, squeeze the numbers. And then they use, and oftentimes, it's the excuse of, oh, well, the pandemic, we had to start closing down. It was coming anyway. You know, so so that that tees us up nicely for the beauty. And, and this is probably one of my favorite uh, chapters, because the, the idea of team of teams the idea of the, you know, chaotic organization to use D.D. Hawk's work, the whole idea of, you know, nature knows how people know how to work instinctively together. If you leave them alone, give them their direction, but then get out of their way. This was the great hidden secret of Procter & Gamble. And I only learned about it because I, I met Dick Lawton, who had, was a faculty, I think at Harvard, he had written about socio-technical systems, which is a history 
we won't dwell on it, but it goes back to the resistance movement against the Nazis in World War II, the idea that small teams, you know, they couldn't know what each other was doing, but they had to work in harmony. So they had to, to develop this idea that the teams would be autonomous. Eric Trist in uh, the United Kingdom started working with coal miners and organizing them. And it turned out that that was a much better way to run a coal mine. That kind of moved into the United States through Douglas McGregor at MIT and a few other people. And people start hearing that there's this other way to organize. And two of the places where it really takes hold, one is crazy and one is intensely normal. And the crazy one is Procter & Gamble. Uh, there's a guy, a uh, follower of Gurdjieff. I'm, I'm sure he's gone now. I, I visited him in his seaside house in Carmel on by the sea long after this happened. And he was a wonderful man and people were devoted to him. A lot of these, a lot of management leaders, Edwards Deming, um, Elliot Jacks, and in this case, this guy, Charlie Crone, they developed these just devoted groups of very, very smart people who follow them and become like a school of thought and travel with them and in many cases speak to the, you know, the leader um, every day or several times a week and are involved in bringing their work forward. And Crone would have been like that. But Procter & Gamble does not like to give away its secrets. And one of its secrets was organ how he organized people on the shop floor. And it's very simple to describe and really hard to do. You have it. Well, actually, now we call it sprints. Um, it's agile leadership, but this is in the 60s. It's you get a team and you set them up and you give them the autonomy to hire their own people, fire their own people, come together as a group. They have a problem to solve and their performance just goes through the roof because they continually improve and they continually innovate. And there's lots and lots of stories. And so the two places where this really started, one was Procter & Gamble in a couple of plants. One was in Lima, Ohio. At the time I was living in Ohio that I was researching this, I was living uh, near um, Miami University. And so I was you know, driving around to places like Lima and, and then uh, to, um, and then there were there was a plant in I think Augusta, Georgia, and another. And Proctor kept such a lid on this that nobody was allowed to talk about it. So like I would just get hints from people like Dick Lawton. And the other one was wide open. Lawton had published about it, and it was a dog food plant in Topeka, Kansas, which is really if you were going to design a place that was far from any sort of cosmopolitan sense of management, you know, you could do worse than Topeka. It was a union plant and it had really sympathetic union leaders. And the head of the plant was a man I admired quite a bit, um, Ed Dulworth. I was just actually talking to his son, Mike, today, who's involved in, in leadership development. And Ed passed away this year. And uh, when I, he went on to be have a career after this as an executive at you know Tops Chewing Gum and other places, is but he was at this time he was a kind of you know early middle aged man in a in an office in this plant in Topeka. They designed the plant and he built it from scratch. They he and and his. Um, the, the executive who designed it and built it and persuaded General Mills to do it. General Foods, not General Mills, General Foods, persuaded General Foods to do it, where um, was a man named Lyman Ketchum. And they designed it so that the plant was like this long tower, four stories high, raw ingredients at the top that, that would go down to the next level where it would be, you know, uh, processed and then the next level where it would be assembled into dog food and the next level where it would be put into bags so like gravity was working on the side of the production process and that's sort of what the plant was like it was all people it was basically it was no bs all of the 
quibbling and interference and stuff like that that management typically does for the sake of control, they didn't do it. They didn't report numbers up to the central location like all the other plants did. They used the numbers to improve their own production. And then they got great results. And they got a pass from having to do all the bureaucratic stuff that people have to do. Now, we call that being agile. At the time, there wasn't a word for it. And they were, the only word that was there was socio-technical systems, which you know wasn't really a good sales job, sales, <laughs> sales term. And um, they, and there was just, people did dissertations on it. One guy was an academic from a major business school and he went and worked there for a summer and then he went and worked there the following summer. And it was studied and written about and General Foods systematically ostracized and punished and maligned the leaders of the project, tried to shut it down for years and couldn't do it until finally it was, they couldn't do it because they couldn't duplicate the performance until finally another company bought the plant and, and shut it down. Um, so it was, and even then bits and pieces of the method lingered on. It wasn't that different than the method that Charlie Crone had, but at the time, this was like a rarefied, unusual thing. Now you walk into a factory and you just think, "This is the way we do things." Yeah, and, and, and I wanted to talk about that because that that idea that the pioneers take the arrows, they actually they did then, they still do. It's very it's very seldom that somebody comes out like a hero. You know, you mentioned, for example, that sometimes people these these heretics would think to themselves, oh, I, I could make a lot of money as a consultant, but then a consultant is a different type of job because they need to sell themselves and all those kind of things. And they can't, they don't have that skill set as well. So many of them went outside the organization and stumbled from job to job trying to recreate the the the, the flowering organization, as you call it. And, and I thought I'd come to that because that's a beautiful term you, you say here, because Crone dubbed his approach the flowering organization and drew an org chart on the wall composed of interlocking circles, like an unfolding flower. I love this power rested, not at the top, but at the center in each individual's core leadership. And it filtered out to related areas of interest as needed. It drew is, and I, I thought that was just a beautiful term and one that just is, is chaotic in, in essence. And yet, ironically, Charlie Crone's own organization was as hierarchical as any. You know, once he left and went out on his own, he was very skilled at building a following and he, you know, he, and he, his approach... I'm not entirely sure it was this, so I probably should put a disclaimer on it, but it was kind of like a franchise operation. He had a set of ideas and then he would license it to other people to use. And they would, so in that way, it was a very skillful way of building a consulting network because he didn't have to be the one with the contacts, but he was the one with the knowledge. And the knowledge was different. And he managed the showmanship around the knowledge you know it was mysterious and you had to join the group and you couldn't show it to other people and and it made sense but you had to kind of be brought in whereas ed and wyman and uh, you know from general foods they wanted everybody to know they thought they had something and they they didn't struggle to kind of shape it they just struggled to talk about it and, and in many cases they had a hard time getting people to listen to them. You know, it's sort of like Galileo trying to get um, the Pope to look at the telescope and see how the planets are circling. You know, if you're not prepared to hear it, it's not going to happen. And it didn't happen. It slowly grew. Probably one of the biggest shocks one of the reasons that we now have enlightened management to the extent we have it is yeah. because Japanese cars came in and, you know, basically 
decimated the American auto industry for about three years in the late 70s. And that opened up people's idea. And that and Deming, another great management showman, came in and, and made people aware that there was a whole other way of thinking about people in the workforce. But it's it's such a pity, isn't it, man, that, you know, the it's not it's not just that no man or woman's a prophet in their own land. It's that you, people need to really feel the pain. They actually need to feel the pain on the bottom line. And when you have some heretic coming forth and saying, look, the world's going this way, either I feel I feel it in my gut, plus I've read many, many papers, plus the consultants and all the other heretics are saying it, the world's going this way and we're stuck here. And they resist that. And it, it's not until their iceberg is nearly melted that they actually go and make the change. That's the that's the still the tragedy, man. It's still the case today. Yeah, it's a little different now, I think. So one of the interesting things about 2021, I would say starting around 2012 is that business leaders expect that they're going to feel the pain. They have a word for it, disruption. <laughs> disruption means we're not going to like this and we're going to have to figure out how to do things differently and it's not going to feel good. And, and in a way, because, you know, 12 years or however many years of expecting disruption made it a little easier to take the pandemic. I mean, isn't it shocking how rapidly most businesses bounce back? It's amazing. And, you know, supply chains are going to bounce back. It's, you know, the, the, all those containers are going to get unloaded in L.A. And, uh, and Spain and every other place. It's, and they're going to bounce back better than they were. We don't appreciate the extent to which decision makers are willing to do change when they have to. The problem with the climate change is not that decision makers aren't willing to make the changes. It's that they think they don't have to. And that's where the resistance comes in. And you can't make me. Right? And now more and more investors and insurance companies and you know suppliers car makers are recognizing that they have to but there's and so what we're seeing right now is a critical mass it's too slow right we've lost the op we humanity has lost the opportunity mm -hmm. to live without the effects of climate change but it's fast enough mm -hmm. that there's some confidence that you know humanity will be able to act fast enough to at least survive. And that's because the culture of business has been one of incorporating change and being willing to, and, and being, and there are enough handles to grab on the box called change our practices that, you know, you, you don't have to be like a superstar. You don't have to be Elon Musk to to really make something happen. In fact, it probably helps if you aren't Elon Musk, um, if you're really going to be part of an organization that's, that's going to turn its course. And uh, so that's the great strength of our time is that it's easy, you know, we're not like our, our institutions, our governments maybe are still like this, but even our governments, enough institutions, enough of the time are resilient enough that they can turn on a dime. I've seen it from, I saw it in some ways at PwC and I saw it at Booz Allen. It's not, it's maybe not the kind of change that people always need. And it's, but it's, the capability is always there. I wanted to throw one thing to you there because you, you, you're a fan of Buckminster Fuller. You quote him in the book. And um, one of my favorite bookie quotes is there's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. And 
when you think about that, when you're a heretic, and you're trying to introduce a new idea, the first thing the scientific management is like going, well, where, how much is it going to make us? And when's it going to be profitable? And you're kind of going, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if it even will. And they're like, er, wrong answer. <laughs> and then the alternative then is, well, the ecosystem changes like the pandemic, it reshuffles the tectonic plates of disruption. And then we have to invest in these caterpillars to see if they're going to work. And that's, that's the problem right there is then, if you are the heretic constantly bringing new caterpillars to the fore and kind of going, look, look at this thing, this could be valuable. And then people are like going and going, I don't know if we're getting value for money out of McCullen, we'll have to get rid of him. <laughs> because he just keeps coming with all these ideas. And what's his scientific return on investment? Not very good. We'll get rid of him. And and that's the the tightrope so many heretics walk. I'm working with Juliet Powell, my um, the, the other primary person in Kleiner Powell International. We're we're working on a book about AI called um, our working title is uh, Who Watches the Watch Robots? Nice. And it's, and we know that that's a phrase we're going to be using, you know, and it goes back. It, and, and what are, you know, in the, in the Heretics book, I compare corporations to giant invisible toddlers that we sort of let loose because they're very young. You know, they're not, they're not very old in historical terms. And just like climate, you know, human effect on climate change goes back a millennia. But corporations, as we know them, are really just 150 to 200 years old. And AI is in some ways a focused crystallization of both the promise and the problem. The promise is you set processes and practices in place and you let them run and amazing things happen. The problem is amazing things happen and you can't control the unintended consequences. And at the end of the day, the, pro the biggest problem with AI, in my view, is that business is personal. And AI, by definition, is impersonal and universal. It is an algorithm with a set of very sophisticated, intricate rules for managing intricate activities. But in order to bring a person into it, the program has to stop and interact and gather more data. And the person is data. The person is not Aiden or Art or any of the other people. And that's not how the world works. That we can't, you know, a lot of people went into engineering. Oh, this is such a bad generalization, but I'll say it. I think a lot of people go into engineering and finance in part because it's easier. People are exhausting. And AI is just, in many ways, the, the natural evolution of that exhaustion. Let's let a program deal with it. <laughs> hey, hey, Art, I notice you come home, you're so much, you're not hitting the bottle of wine, you're so much more relaxed, you're meditating. Why is that? Oh, we got rid of all the people, we just have AI now. <laughs> <laughs> Until... Until, you know, the self-driving car goes, well, you know, un until the self-driving car goes and uh, blows up the uh, automated factory by crashing into it, the, which it never would do because there's AI. It would do something more pernicious like, you know, who knows, like uh, <sighs> monitoring uh, who's following along and the appropriate thing, whatever. I we could get into AI and that would be <laughs> well, one of my one of my ones man is if you think about the about you know weaponizing autonomous vehicles like if you hacked a whole fleet of cars you could turn them like just like 911 just turn them into weapons and just actually use them because you know I, I, I actually believe that the 
our understanding of of hacking and uh, cybersecurity is way less than actually is the capability. Like, it, like if they want to do something, they can do it. Like, this, you know, my my vast security system ain't doing crap on my computer for me. If they want to get into my computer, they can get into my computer. And I think that the counter terrorism is not up to the terrorism. I think the interesting question is who is they? In when it where AI is concerned, um, they are hands off as much as they're hands on. They started the machinery in motion. Having said that, we're not backing. You know, we're not going to give up uh, uh, translation programs and uh, you know and and, and uh, personalized greetings, and uh, we're not going to give up Alexa, and and we're not going to give up those little you know, the aspect of our word processing programs that fill in the word for us. Where AI is here to stay, just as corporations are here to stay. And maybe this is a good a good sort of transition point that the challenge with the numbers culture is that its abuses are manifest, obvious, and hard to fix. The answer is not coming up with better automated systems. You can, we need to come up with better automated systems, but they're not going to solve the problem. They're not going to solve the negative side, the abuses and exploitation that really has been, you know, that's all around us. And they're not going to solve the positive side, the aspiration to really, you know, um, to genuinely give people the spirit, the environment, the vernacular, the neo vernacular environment that they need to live in a spirited way. You know, the kind of places that Christopher Alexander talked about and the, the conversational spaces and the real connections that exalt people. They're not, and I know a lot of people who are trapped in the negative side, and a lot of people, a lot, and and most of them have kept alive their, you know, their their still some hope for the positive side. It's like Oscar Wilde's line, you know, um, we're all standing in the mud, but some of us are looking at the stars, and. I think the I think that's the big challenge of our time is to give not just voice but agency to people in a way that is sober and realizes and recognizes just how brutal and messed up we can be while still recognizing that most of the time we're driving in our lane, we're leaving enough space to the car in front of us and we're not getting into accidents. And in fact, we're getting somewhere. If we have time today, Art, we might use that to link into the work on Kodak and uh, Henry Ford. Uh, and um, I, I thought actually the way we've gone here, we kind of started the start, then we jumped to chapter four and we'll go backwards. So we'll bring people to the NTLers, but I'll tee you up because there's there's many of of our audience are CEOs of manufacturing plants, and the, <laughs> these lines will actually make a lot of sense to them. There's a there's a firstly a lovely line that ties to what you're saying from a human, if you call it a humanic perspective, you say in place of consensus or democracy there was a kind of jazz like creativity. That's where I got that line from. Initiatives were carried out when someone championed them and nobody else came up with a good reason to get in the way. Real authority should, <laughs> real authority should be based, Crone would say, not on who had their highest rank, the best skills or the most charisma, but on who was ready to play a solo, who cared the most about the particular initiative and could act most effectively on it. To make the organization live up to that notion, the salaried managers had to take on a leadership role that was unfamiliar to most of them. Did they have enough faith in the process to let a problem go unsolved for as long as it took for someone to step forward and assume leadership? 
and would they have enough self-awareness and this was truly the hard part to recognize when it was appropriate for them to be the leader because they cared more than anyone else i, I love that line and uh, hopefully you're enjoying hearing your work <laughs> played back to you here um but but it but this this then goes backwards to go okay well where do they get that from and they get this from then chapter two which is the ntlers and the t groups and this this was a beautiful chapter the understanding of where the origins of this was for me was just beautiful and i know so much more about it now than i did then just from having been alive um david Cantor, who is a, a systems family therapist and then an organizational therapist he too passed away recently um david had a construct called open, closed, and random, which were the, the all of us grow up with, and I probably rooted in childhood, of the way it ought to be. Some people grow up um, feeling like authority should reside in a boss. We should have very hierarchical organizations, kind of like the books up on your shelf there that are all color coordinated. <laughs> 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 do, you know, do you know why do you know why that was they were in chaos and people kept writing to me and saying what's the order and i was actually trying to explain that it was by depth so i could just push them against the wall that's behind them and they were like no i can't take it so people like find a better system and then i just recently reordered them by color <laughs> so well spotted you know and, and that's how people feel about organizations it ought to be they ought to be what david Cantor called they ought to be um, closed systems. You know where power is. You know who's in charge of the boss, who, who's in charge of the company. You know who the boss is. And then there's open, which are kind of like your books over on the bottom shelf on the left there. They're, they're, there's a sense to them, but they're not rigid. But, you know, and so that's if, if you know, closed is like a symphony orchestra creates beautiful music. You need it to play certain types of things. But if you wanted to do like a jazz note and, you know, a, 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 a jazz piece, you'd have to rehearse it for, you know, just as long. Uh, the, the open organization is like a um, chamber music orchestra. Um, authority resides with consensus democracy the you know the rules are designed to allow people to participate everyone gets a voice this is the type of organization where we go around the room and make sure everybody is heard would help you if you want to move quickly but everybody is heard and in the end the organization goes where everybody thinks it ought to go it draws on the wisdom of everybody some people do not feel comfortable unless the organization is like that and then there's the third one the random organization which is sort of like your books on the lower right you know <laughs> whichever book it looks most interesting that's the one i'm gonna pull out and read at the moment you know i'm gonna have most viewers of the youtube video ever people who are listening are gonna go and tune into youtube now thanks art <laughs> well we should have put on some makeup if we knew this if we had um yeah if we had planned it it would have been closed if we had reached an agreement upon it it would have been open and if we and what we did do was random we i just thought of it and said it sometimes that works uh i don't know if you remember the first pirates of the caribbean movie which is um i've never seen the other ones but the first one is it's the only one i've seen by the way <laughs> yeah me too and and so you remember the british army you know they're marching lockstep they win in the end they're beautiful to watch, but when Kira Knightley goes overboard, the governor's daughter, they can't save her from drowning. That's a closed system. But they win in the end. Then uh, Jack Sparrow, the you know the Johnny Depp pirate that, that Keith Richards like, he's random, but his crew is open. You go down, you know, he assembles this pirate's crew to run a ship, and you go down the line, and there's a very you know a very small person. There's a person who can't speak, but he's got a parrot on his shoulder. The parrot does the talking for him because everybody gets a voice in an open system. And at the end of the line is Jack Sparrow's old girlfriend. He stole her boat. She slaps him. And he says, I deserve that. Because in an open system, there are rules 
and even the boss has to follow the rules. And then there's the evil pirates, you know, Jeffrey Rush, Barbosa, the, the flamboyant pirates who have like a monkey carrying medallions. And at one point, Kira Knightley confronts him and says, you know, the pirate's code means you have to put me to shore. And he says something like this. He says, uh, well, first of all, the pirate's code is for pirates and you're not a pirate. And secondly, and everybody hates this. I never actually said I would put you to shore, did I? <laughs> and then he says, the pirate's code is not really rules. It's more like what you'd call guidelines. That's what it's like to be like an open person working for a random boss. And that's what people like Charlie Cron were like. You know, they were gifted improvisational jazz players. And all three of those forms are human. The problem with corporations is they got caught up in the closed system, like many governments do, because there are people who don't feel comfortable unless they know exactly where authority is coming from and what's going to happen next. And, you know, that's just the way they are. It's not good. It's not bad. And then there are gradually some companies became more open. Having an or actually what tended to be open were teams within companies where there was consensus and where they could act. Power is very difficult to maintain in a large open system. You need rules and structures for it, and companies don't really work that well with large rules and structures. And then the but companies do work well when they're random. And a lot of you know, a lot of the best known bosses male and female, uh, but mostly male, are um, random people. But the really, you know, the great bosses of any background are often random people with both open and closed people in close connection with them, supporting them, and because you need, you need all three. So the age of heretics, we're going to... The age of heretics recognized that the closed nature of the numbers culture had to be had to be um, changed. It, the heretics I wrote about recognized that, and a lot of the story is about injecting random elements and open elements into a closed business culture. And now, you know, a lot of people in random businesses are kind of wishing maybe it should be a little more closed. <laughs> awesome, Art. And where can, where can people find out more about your work, your books as well, the future books? The best central place is kleinerpowell.com. K-L-E-I-N-E-R-P-O-W-E-L-L.com. Um, you might think it's like Kleiner Perkins and um, Colin Powell, but it's not. It's a different Kleiner and a different Powell, but it's spelled the same. And um, most of what we're doing now is I'm the other. There's a if the neuroscience and leadership is of interest, then that's at wiseadvocate.com, which is W I S E advocate, A D V O C, and then the number eight. Com. And, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to hopefully get you back to cover Wise Advocate as well, because I was absolutely torn which book to cover as well. And now you throw another one in the in the in the works as well. But there's a there's a quote, Art, I'm going to finish today's show on. I thought it was a, a beautiful one that I'll finish and then I'll wrap it up. So this one is um, your definition of a modern her heretic. You say a heretic is someone who sees the truth that contradicts the conventional wisdom of the institution to which or he or she belongs and remains loyal to both entities, the institution and the new truth. I said that in the intro. Heretics are not apostates. They do not leave the church. Instead, they try to influence the larger institution to change for its own sake because they think that its survival and their own role within it depends on meeting the truth halfway. Heretics tend to pay a price. In medieval times, they often paid the ultimate price. But today's heretics are not burned at the stake, but they may be relegated to backwater waters or pressured to resign. 
They see that their point of view ignored or their efforts undermined. They see others take credit for their ideas and their work. Worst of all, they see the organization decline as they predicted it would. They may see the leaders of that organization exploit or perhaps sell it and profit accordingly, while the truth that the heretic fought to bring to the surface, the truth that might have led to a robust, sustainable company, remains unarticulated and lost. In the meantime, the skills all of us are going to need as citizens and as private individuals have to do with learning to be responsible for large scale endeavors without being in control of them. Corporate heretics have pioneered the use and understanding of these skills. Author of The Age of Heretics, a history of radical thinkers who reinvented corporate management, Art Kleiner, thank you for joining us for part one. Thanks so much for hosting me and setting this up and this conversation. Thanks so much, Aiden. As always, thank you to Zai at Global Fintech, which is innovating within its own area of expertise, building integrated financial services for digital native and non-native businesses. Check them out at hellozai.com.